Welcome back to Tie That Guy. I'm John Wesley Chatham, and this is uh, my good pal, Ty Frank. How are you, Ty? Uh, good, man. You never use my middle name. It's Ty Cecil Frank. In all of the years that I've known you, I didn't know your middle name was Cecil. And well, uh, I just made up that it is. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> today's a very special tie in that guy because Ty and I are going to be discussing and talking about our f- one of our favorite directors of all time. What's his name, Ty? Yeah. So let's, let's do some background before we drop the name. So last time we recorded one of these, we were, you know, it was obviously for us for an episode of the show. And we started talking about all the stuff that we do in the show that reminds us of things from our favorite directors. And the name that comes up over and over and over again when we have this conversation is John Carpenter, the classic 70s and 80s action and horror director, went through multiple phases of his career, Um, so many movies that have greatly influenced both Wes as a performer and me as a writer. So we were like, maybe we should just do it rather than talking about John Carpenter all the time when we're doing our regular episodes. Maybe we should just have a John Carpenter episode, get it out of our system. And then we realized we'll probably wind up doing two or three John Carpenter episodes because he did so much work and we can't do it all at once. I'm sorry. I, th- I thought we were, <laughs> I thought we were doing Michael Bay. <laughs> we're doing John Carpenter. <laughs> okay. I'll do it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if I was like, you know, one of our favorite directors of all time, one of the greatest Michael Bay. <laughs> um, no, John Carpenter has, uh, has been a very special director to me, and I know he has been to Ty. And some of his movies I watch once a year. There's just something about him, and then the thing about him that I love that comes through in his movies, he brings fun and magic to his films. And so, you know, we as we decided to talk about it, we were like, let's break him up into three eras. And so we, we were going to start with the beginning, uh, his USC days, and that first film coming out of it. But you know what's interesting is uh, going back and reading a little bit about him, he has that thing that I, that I really am attracted to in, in um, artists where he just is just honest. Does that, you know what I'm saying? Like he just tells the truth. And in our industry and, in, and just in life in general, there's so many people that are always managing your perception of them. And every now and then you meet somebody that's just like a drink of cold water where they just are who they are. Even if you disagree with them, even if there's just something pure and honest about. And I find that the people that do work that really resonate, whether it's music or writing or, or directing or acting, is people that just tell the truth and that are devoted and interested in the truth, not getting a reaction out of you. Not, they're not shooting for praise. They're just trying to tell the truth. And John Carpenter is certainly in that category. And that's one of the things that I find in common with a lot of these people that, uh, that I admire, that I look up to. When you, when you see them talk, they just tell the truth. And he was talking about growing up in Kentucky. And he's like, you know, I was a scared, sensitive kid. Like, it, it was a weird place for me. I did not understand Jim Crow. And a lot of his movies, particularly in Precinct 13, is like being surrounded by evil because he thought, you know, he saw racism as this evil that existed in the atmosphere, like in the fog. And yeah. it was that fog of ignorance that was over the town and, and caused this thing. And so it's like a lot of that fear and everything is, is interwoven in his movies. Yeah, I, I agree. I, authenticity, you know, we've talked about that before, especially in, in acting. But, you know, I've, I mentioned before in writing, too, that authenticity, you can feel it. Like if you are the reader or you are the viewer of the thing, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to fake it. And there are there are a few performers that just feel very authentic. And I think in John Carpenter's case, it is both his greatest strength and also his greatest weakness because he is very authentic. And I think he his heart has to be in something all the way or it's you can you can sense it. So, like, if you look at his early career, which is what we're going to talk about today, when he was outside the studio system, when he was financing his own projects and developing his own projects and nobody was telling him what to do. He made some of the best work he ever made. 
And then you look at some of his later career when he got started getting more money, when he was more tied to the studio system, when other people's voices were in the mix, that's some of his weakest work. Because I think with a guy like John Carpenter, he's either a hundred percent authentic or he's, or he's, he's not. I'm like, he, it's like you, the minute that somebody else's voice is in the mix, the minute that he's trying to please another master, like all the, all the magic falls out of his work. And I think a lot of people like that. It's, it's that way. It, it is their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. Yeah. It's interesting because he had so much control and it was such a, an anomaly for a director of his age and with his experience. And like when he did assault on pre six, uh, precinct 13, he had his name above the title in complete final cut. And I mean, that's unheard of for a new director such as himself, but his talent really thrives. There was one component that you were talking about that his talent thrives in complete freedom, complete control, but also uh, his creativity thrives when there's a lack of something. So there's always a lack of money. There's always yeah. a lack of time. And that seems to be, that brings out the best in him. And that, you know, and, and when he yeah. does, uh, when there are those search uh, situations where he does have plenty of time and money, and I've seen this, with a lot of directors when their early work is so powerful and so good. And then when they start doing these big studio things, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to say anything bad about Spider-Man, but if you go back and look at Sam Raimi, like the evil dead and like, he has such a unique point of view and such a voice. And then as he started getting more and more su successful, it was just that point of view and that sense of humor and that way of looking at the world just was watered down. And it was a, a, a studio three act structure movie. Um, that was just built to bring in the bucks, you know? Now, I am a fan of Raimi's Spider-Man Spider movies. I, I, I still love those movies, so I, I definitely don't want to bash those. But, but the, I think a lot of uh, creative types... Uh, so uh, let me back up a little bit. Daniel Abraham, my writing partner, he's the first one who said to me, and I'm sure he stole it from somebody else, that the painting is defined by the edges of the canvas. That you cannot have a painting on a canvas of infinite size, right? That, that the size of the canvas you're working on tells you what kind of thing you can paint on it. And I think that's true for almost every creative part, right? That if you're a director, the amount of time that you have to make the thing, the amount of money that you have to make the thing become the edges of the canvas for you. And that lets you know how far you can go in any direction. And, and, and you wind up with these very tight, very, very, um, concise stories because the director's staying inside the lines, you know, uh, when the edges of the canvas go away, when, when you reach a point where the studio is basically like, like, do whatever you want, you have infinite money, you have infinite time. Then the story starts to feel very directionless and kind of meandery. And, and for me, the big, the big example of that is you look at the first three Lord of the Rings movies when new line wasn't sure it was going to work when Peter Jackson was working under a ton of constraints to get those three movies done and in the can and under budget. And uh, there was, there was a lot of pressure on him. Then when he went back to make the Hobbit movies, all that pressure went away. They were like the Lord of the Rings were some of the most successful movies of all time here, have infinite money, have infinite time, do whatever you want. And they're not as good. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're meandering. They feel like there's no strong through line. They, they just kind of wander around for, for nine hours that to me is the perfect example of that. and i want to go back uh to be clear that you know i i enjoyed those spider movies spider-man movies too i wasn't uh saying anything negative about them I, what i was saying is that unique voice and sense of humor when we first saw the evil dead movies that it's i don't really see that in the spider-man movies and there is certainly not as much yeah, and there's something about when you when you when you sit down and watch evil dead or evil dead 2 there's just something about, you know, these kids going into woods with cameras and just using their imagination and doing that. And there's something a little bit raw and rough about the acting and the production value and everything. And you immediately, you know, I think in some ways it kind of lowers your uh, standards or what it puts you in a place where like, oh, we're just going to have fun. I'm just going to go along for the ride with the story. Um, sometimes if you see something that's really polished and high production value. You start to have high standards. And you, 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 ha you don't have as much fun, I don't think, with it. And that's certainly in John Carpenter's case. And we can talk a little bit about Dark Star. Um, you probably know more about that than me. I, I, 
I didn't really get through it uh, when I tried to watch it, but I think the story behind Dark Star is more interesting than the movie. Yeah, no, I have I have watched Dark Star. I've watched Dark Star probably three or four times now because I the first time I watched it, I was a kid. Dark Star was playing on HBO, I think, when I was like 13, maybe. I was pretty young. And, my, and so when I'd hang out at my friend's house, they, and and I was I was at that age where anything that was sci-fi was automatically good. Yeah, like it was impossible for sci-fi to be yeah. bad. So I'd be hanging at my friend's house. His pet family at HBO. Dark Star would come on. You know, we'd watch it because it was sci-fi, right? So it it was um, in the it was in the HBO rotation. I'm pretty sure it was because I remember watching it on HBO. I mean, it's it's I it's kid. understandable, but that's uh, that's really impressive for that. What what years was this? Oh, this was, I mean, this, I, this was probably 1980. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Right? You know, like, yeah, I, and you got to remember, HBO back then was not HBO now. HBO no, back they, then put anything on. They had yeah. to fill a lot of space. They would have their premiere That's movies. Right. You know, they would have their movies that they spent, you know, their budget on that would come on Friday night, Saturday night, whatever. But in all the other hours and stuff, they would have to fill space. And that's where you would discover, you know, HBO, I learned a lot by just being an HBO fan for so many years um, of all the, yeah. the movies they'd put, like Critters and Ghoulies and all those movies would come on HBO late yeah. at night. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I first saw it. And then as an adult, I had a conversation with somebody about Dark Star and my memory of it was very fuzzy. So I was like, I, I need to rewatch that. And then as an adult, more sophisticated sci-fi palette i rewatched it and obviously there are some huge flaws it was that movie that that movie is not a great movie but for a, an example of sort of college guerrilla filmmaking uh with some ambition to it because they were making a sci-fi show so i mean a sci-fi movie so that's ambitious there's some interesting things in there and and we'll probably you and i will talk about it but there are there are two halves to dark star there is the crazy college guerrilla filmmaking short film Dark Star. And then there's the padded out. We added a bunch of shit so that it would be at 80 minute runtime. So it could be released in thir- theaters Dark Star. And all of the best stuff is that first stuff. The college guerrilla filmmaking. We got a thousand dollars and a camera we borrowed from school. And we're just going to make a sci-fi film. That stuff is the strongest stuff. Then somebody gave them a little money and said, add another, you know, 50 minutes of runtime to it. That stuff is the weakest stuff by far. It is pretty damn impressive to me that these college students in the 70s scraped up enough money to do these, these visual effects and create this thing that actually played in theaters and actually had a following and a cult following. And it actually made a lot of money. John Carpenter didn't see any of that money and, and Dave O'Banion didn't see any of that money. Um, is that his name David O'Banion? David Banyan. No, Dan, Dan O'Banyan. O'Banyan. I'm sorry, Dan O'Banyan, which who later yeah. went on to uh, one of the writers for Alien. Oh. But uh, you go back and it was like it, they would they would like uh, take backpacks um, out of uh, out of the uh, the janitor's closet that he used to spray, you know, like to spray for bugs and stuff. And he would they would take that and they would steal it and then modify it so it would be like space backpacks and all this stuff. And you watch it and you're like, Jesus Christ, this, right. this, this shit kind of works, you know? And then what's weird is the kind of uh, tonal shift where it kind of gets more, it's more serious in the beginning and then it starts to get kind of comedy and, you know, there's even kind of slapstick with the beach ball thing and all that. Yeah, the, and the slapstick elements, I think, are the weakest elements. Mm-hmm. The, the, best, the best scenes in Dark Star are the scenes where it's a bunch of guys sitting in a cramped little control room talking to each other and and just sort of trading barbs and it's it's all very sort of mumblecore directing and and writing. That stuff is really good. And then the later scenes where the guys are trying to figure out how to stop the bomb, right? Where the guys trying to talk the bomb out of blowing up and and they're they're trying to and the other guys trying to figure out how to get it to detach from the ship. And it, all of that stuff is happening. That stuff is all really good. The padding in between those two things is not good. Now, let me ask you a question. If when you were a kid watching HBO with your friend and watching Dark Star on television, did you have the ambition or did you know that maybe one day I would write science fiction stories? No. Really? That was, no, that was not, not on your radar? No. No. I, you got to remember that my background. I, I grew up in a very 
uh, conservative religious family, people didn't have ambitions like that. You know, that was worldly thinking, you know, to have ambition to be a filmmaker, that kind of stuff. Things like being a filmmaker, like that was magical. Somebody else gets to be a filmmaker. You don't get to be a filmmaker. Yeah. Somebody else gets to write things. You don't get to write right. things. And so even aspiring to that was like beyond yeah. a thing that you could even think about. So watching those early movies, th this is an interesting segue because watching those early movies, watching things like Dark Star, which is objectively not a great movie, but when you're a kid, you know, it's sci-fi, so it's magical. They did feel magical because the idea that a normal person could make that was not in my head. Like whoever made those things, they were magical mm. beings that somehow had this secret knowledge of how you make stories and how you make, put things on screen. And, and so those early movies before you, you realize, oh, this is just a bunch of humans working together to make something before you realize it, they do have a magic quality in your memory. Mm -hmm. Dark star is, is in that list of things that like when I remembered it before I went and rewatched it as an adult, it, it was magical in my head. Um, and some things survived the cut, you know, like when I went back and rewatched like, Escape from New York as, you know, because I had seen it when I was a kid and I remembered it being amazing. And then I watched it again as an adult. And I'm like, no, this is still amazing. Yeah, like, yeah. like I, my, my, the kid God version damn of me classic. Right. right, right. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's interesting to me because Assault on Precinct 13, it's one of the, it's the first, like, first of all, I can't believe this is John Carpenter movie that I haven't seen. I haven't seen it until we started preparing for this. And it was one of those movies that was ubiquitous in all of conversations about John Carpenter, but all like great uh, 70s movies. And, um, yeah. and so I was like, holy shit, you know? I, I, and I think the reason I probably got turned off from it is I know they did a remake of it and the remake had lukewarm reviews and yeah. it just didn't seem interesting to me. So I was like, all right, I'll watch this assault on uh, Precinct 13. Now, when, when we watch uh, Escape from New York, it, you know, we still love that movie and it holds up, but we also have the nostalgia of seeing it when we were a kid, like, so there's so many things yeah. that you love, like old friends, you know, seeing Snake Bliskin roll up, you're like, God damn right, Snake Bliskin. So, uh, I went back and watched Assault on Precinct 13, and I was that experience of watching something for the first time that was a John Carpenter film, and I got to feel what it was yeah. like when I watched those early John Carpenter stands for the first time because it was an excellent movie. It was beyond my expectations. It was so raw, so powerful. It you and it did one of my favorite things that movies do. And like Aliens Two is or uh, Sicario did this is where you take the energy of horror and infuse that with action. Yep. And he was a big uh, Romero fan. He was influenced by those zombie movies, and this was a zombie movie. But it was in yeah. some ways to me more interesting than a zombie movie because there was this cult like gang that you they didn't really get into and in explaining so there was a mystery about them and a mystery to to their motivations and they they did spooky weird shit like cutting their wrist and pouring blood in a in a glass thing and they threw it on the police station it shattered on the door and it's like what what the fuck <laughs> like you know it's like this crazy you yeah. know it's like what the fuck is that about and just the techniques of these guys assaulting is how zombies, they're mindless. I think they don't even have any dialogue through the whole movie, and they're vicious and fearless. Um, and, and, you know, and John Carpenter is, is, you know, ahead of his time. And like, it was a black protagonist, a, a black lead, a black hero. And then the gang, the bad guys in the 70s, in and, and a movie like this, it was all different races. So it wasn't about race with the yeah. bad guys. Yeah, and, and, and they do have a few lines of dialogue, not not a lot, uh, but the, you know, I mean, there's a couple places where the gang is psyching themselves up for the attack, and it, with the the reason I mention that is because one of the interesting things is when some of their members get killed, you see that's like emotionally devastating. Mm -hmm. That that some of like like the the when the guy so uh, there's a character who shows up in Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Who's the one who shoots the little girl? He's like, he's like the super scary. Don't, don't run he's over like that. This tall, yeah. skinny dude. Huh? Yeah. No, no, but I'm, I, I'm just mentioning yeah. that character. Who was, he was also a character in, in uh, Escape from New York. Uh, John, uh, clearly John Carpenter liked this actor. When his character gets killed and they talk about that, when the gang talks about the fact that he's been killed, 
like if they're not that this is this is the genius of the movie is is there are moments where they feel like zombies but there are moments when they feel like people when they're sad when they're when they're angry about things that have happened and it's very unsettling because if they're just zombies then it's okay to shoot them. but then you see that you see them be upset about their guys getting killed and then they're not just zombies now i think stallone's cobra to use your word i think they ripped off this movie because it was this mindless like yeah. cult gang you know and and you're like what are they motivated yeah. by what are they after and you're you're just in for the ride because they're so bizarre and weird but i want to i i do want to talk about that scene so if somebody is a if somebody is an aspiring storyteller or is there you know one of the things that really disappoints me when i'm watching a movie is when they dissipate tension when they don't have to dissipate tension and if if you can yeah. it's a uh if you can build the tension to the point and then have the climax be something that you didn't expect it's such a and in this case horrifying but it's such an emotional payoff right and it it brings you right into the next the next sequence the next story because now it's like all you you're you've been you've been all the rules of what normally happens whatever that's all thrown out the window so in this movie, there's a, there's a sequence where there's an ice cream truck, and he's, he's got the music playing, and, he's, uh, and he sees this car of bad guys roll up, and he doesn't trust them. He doesn't like the look of them, and they're driving by him. Now, nine times out of ten, the movie would have the showdown happen there because they would want to get to the next scene. They would want to keep things moving, they, you know, and, uh, but they just drove by him, and he reaches for his gun, and they just drove by him. So now you know this guy doesn't trust these guys. And he's got a gun. Yep. And so now you have a little bit of tension. Yep. So when they leave, you're like, oh, you know, it dissipates a little bit, right? And then he kind of waits and he's a little bit, and then he, that thing comes and this, cute, this pure, sweet, innocent little girl comes to get a, who was played by Kim Richards, who was uh, the little girl in Witch Mountain, who was a Disney girl. And it was, you know, really smart. She comes over and she's ordering an ice cream cone. He's not thinking about those guys anymore, but we see them. We see them come back in the camera. So yeah. now that tension is, boom, now you know that there, there's something going on. They're going to want to do something, and you know he has a gun, and this is going to be a showdown. And then uh, she gets the ice cream, and she leaves, and you're like, oh, thank God, the girl. This is so Hitchcock. Oh, thank God, the girl's gone. At least this is going right. to open. Then the guys yeah. show up and yank his ass out of the car. You have one more surprise cut because he think, you know, he goes, sits down, and they fucking yank his ass out of the car. So all the tension has been perfectly calibrated to the to this big thing when they throw him out of the car, but you're thinking at least the fucking girl isn't there, right? And, and the guy the, right. he, got he got away. away. And this weird thing is the guy opens up the, his mouth and he puts the gun in his mouth, and you're like, oh shit, is he gonna blow his brains on the on the? I, that's so cold bloody. So then the girl, the girl <laughs> realizes she got the fucking wrong ice cream, and you're like, no, it's not the wrong ice cream. Stop, stop, little girl. Stop, Kim Bridgers. <laughs> Go back to Rich Mountain. So then yep. she turns around and she's coming back yep. and you're like, oh my fucking God, they got a gun in his mouth. This whole shit's going crazy. She goes on the other side of the thing and the dude levels the gun and fucking executes the little girl. And, it, I, and it's, it's one of the most brutal oh scenes ever. Oh my God. And I'm, you know, watching this in, in, in this day and age and I have, I don't remember the last time I, a movie has shocked me. I did not see that coming. I was completely shocked. My mouth was wide open. It was built up. And I don't even know if I, if I liked it. I don't even know if I agree with it. But I, I can't stop thinking about it. And it, that is an indelible moment yeah. in, in film history. And if somebody is like looking at technique and how to build tension and how to build suspense, that scene was uh, just epic. Just, just, I mean, just so well done. And he shot the little girl. I can't. I don't know what he was thinking at the time. Uh, he was thinking that he needed to shock the audience and he needed to show that this gang was not bound by social norms, social convention. That as movie watchers, as TV watchers who understand the way stories happen, we see the little girl coming back and our fear is that she will see the ice cream guy get executed, that she'll see it happen. That's our fear, Right. Because that's what happens in movies and TV shows. That's the shocking moment is that the poor little kid sees the guy get murdered and she's traumatized. 
John Carpenter knows that. He knows that that's where our head is. He knows that we're going, oh, no, she's going to see the guy get killed. And so he says, no, you don't know. And just has the most shocking possible end of that scene you could have where the guy shoots the little girl. And now we're, now we're completely off kilter. And, and this is one of the things that John Carpenter instinctively does that, that a few of my favorite directors instinctively understand is how to keep an op- audience off balance where you, you, you set up the scene, the audience, because we've watched a lot of TV, we've watched a lot of movies, we've read a lot of books, we know how stories work. We see the setup and we go, oh, this is the next thing that's going to happen. And he goes, no, motherfucker, you don't know shit. And he yanks the rug out from under you and you just spend the rest of the movie off balance because you don't know what's going to happen. And that feeling of being off balance, that feeling of being surprised all the time is so rare in media that that's why those directors become our favorites. Because when I'm watching a John Carpenter movie, those early John Carpenter movies, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm waiting for him to tell me, like, like all the things that I think are going to happen don't. And then he does something different. Th- this is that classic scene. That is what that shooting the little girl is about. He yanks, that little girl is the rug that he yanks up from under us. And we spend the rest of the movie, we spend the next hour not knowing what's going to happen. And it's, it's just, and I brilliant. love, I mean, to me, that's, that's the cinema cinematic experiences where the movie pushes you to the edge, leaves you off balance. And you can, the only thing you can do is watch the next scene. You know, yeah. an interesting note is that Mel Gibson inadvertently made it, made assault uh, on precinct 13 popular in Australia. Cause he was already, uh, you know, I think he already did Mad Max at the time. So he's already an Australian star, but he's doing an interview. And he was saying, he goes, I love movies that take things to the edge, that surprise me, that shock me, that things I haven't seen. He goes, I just saw this movie called Assault on Pre-613. And then that really called on in Australia. And it was a big hit in, in uh, London and mm. in, in, uh, Europe, too. The, the U.S. didn't really get it at the time, but it ended up, you know, catching on um, from that point forward. But, you know, one of the things, too, that really struck me. So my dad, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I always talk about how much me and my dad love movies, but one of my dad's favorite movies was uh, Howard Hawks, Rio Bravo. And, um, yeah. and you're yep. watching this and this is, this is Rio Bravo, you know, and then you go back and, uh, and, you know, I, I, you know, John Carpenter talks about Howard Hawks being his favorite director and, you know, and Rio Bravo was one of his favorite movies. So obviously this was heavily yeah. influenced by Rio Bravo. And, and I was, I'm, imp- yeah. I'm impressed. And one of the things in our deep dive of John Carpenter, what I'm learning most and having a renewed respect for it, is him as a writer. All the movies that he's written and constructed and, you know, a lot of movies that he didn't make that, that he wrote um, that I really love. But this movie was very well set up and structured. You're absolutely right. His ability to craft story is a big part of why he's great. I mean, he's a, he's a good director. He's got a good vis- visual sense, but... But story structure and, and how to craft a story are, I think, just instinctive for him. I think he just, he, just, he just knows how to do that because all of his stuff shares that, that trait. But the, the, the thing that I wanted to mention, to, going back to what we were talking about earlier, is with the rug pool, if you do it wrong, it, so the, it, again, talking about John Carpenter as a, story, as a writer and a storyteller, if you do that wrong, the, the shooting the little girl scene, the reason it works so well is because it absolutely feels earned. It's not just a random thing that happens, right? Like he has given us all of the information we need to know that that's going to happen. We've seen the scary gang guys driving by. They're fucking creepy as hell. We've seen that the, the, the ice cream guy is worried about the crime. So he carries a gun in his ice cream truck, which is like, you know, that's an escalation, right? We, we've seen the, the little girl get the ice cream and leave, but now we see her come back and, and we know the, you know, the horror movie convention is if somebody gets away from the bad guy and goes back, they're going to die, right? That's that we, we understand that. And so, you know, he signaled to us, this is the character that dies because they got away from the scary thing and now they're turning around and going back. So when she gets shot, it is absolutely an earned moment. And so the rug pull moment for, you know, writers and directors, you know, storytellers, the rug pull moment has to, it has to be incredibly surprising and totally earned or it doesn't work. 
Because a lot of writers and directors will try to do that rug pull moment by just having some random out of left field shit happen. And then it's like, look how surprising that was that this random out of left field shit happened. Aren't you surprised? And then you just feel like manipulated because it's like, well, of course I'm surprised because you pulled some shit out of left field that nobody knew about. So, of course, I didn't know that was going to happen. But you don't feel like uh, – so Robin Veith, you know who Robin Veith is. Of course, she was a writer on her show. The phrase that she would use in the writer's room, which I love this phrase, friend of, friend of Ty and that guy, the phrase that she used was surprising inevitability. When, if you can craft a moment that is incredibly surprising in the moment, but on reflection, felt inevitable. That's, that yeah. is that is what John Carpenter does yeah. instinctively. Yeah. So he over and over again he does these moments of surprising yeah. inevitability, and that I, I it feels to me that that is a an instinct that is very hard to train into somebody. But if you have it instinctively, it, like you, it's like this huge. And if it's done sort of. right, if that is which is very hard to pull off, where. You were surprised, like fully surprised, but then you, when you go back and reflect and you realize it was inevitable, it's such a rare thing, yeah. but when it's pulled off, it, it is remembered for eternity. For instance, the reveal yep. in The Sixth Sense, when you realize that Bruce Willis was dead, you know, or yep. Luke, I'm your father. And I mean, you know, how important of a moment was Luke, I'm your father? How how does that echo into time immemorial, right? Like, so you see when, he's, when he says, you know, Luke, I'm your father, and you're like, no shit. And you start thinking back, and you're like, holy shit, it all makes sense. When Bruce Willis, when you realize that he's dead, then you're like, wait a minute, he can't be, but he had, and then you go back, and you're like, oh shit, he didn't, they didn't talk at dinner, or he didn't do this at thing, and this, and he had this thing, and it was like, did you, were you fooled by that reveal in the sixth sense, or did you know it all along? Okay, so I, a part of that movie was spoiled for me in that everybody was saying, there's an amazing twist at the end. Like, I, they didn't say what the twist was, but they were like, there's an amazing twist at the end. And when it starts out with him getting shot, and then about halfway into the movie, I was like, yeah. oh, he's dead. Right. That's what the twist is. Now, if I, if I hadn't yeah. been told that, if, if people hadn't been running around going, there's yeah. an amazing twist at the end, I wouldn't yeah. have been thinking that way, and I probably right. would have been fooled. It, 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 yeah. it, fl so, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I was there like on opening weekend. It was a horror movie. And yeah. that was one of the great movie going experiences I've ever had because I didn't know the director. I didn't know anything about the story. The character was so uniquely vulnerable yeah. that it just broke my heart to see this little kid going through this. And also, like, as a kid yeah. that has a very, vivid imagination you know like you this is the shit i was imagining anyway like when you're there's this there's <laughs> there's this clip do you follow snoop dog on instagram i don't oh my no. god he I, I don't have an instagram he's account the, he's the that's all i'm only on his active on instagram but he's the greatest follow of all time but he posts these hilarious videos and he posts these videos one time and he said what it feels like to take out the garbage at night. <laughs> so, like, he has this dude. He has this dude. You know, you know when you go out to the garbage at night and you kind of put it in there and you just kind of haul ass back in the house? So he has this dude coming yeah. out, and he's going in there, and, and it shows the walk, right? And they just, through editing, they just exaggerate how long he has to walk to get behind his house to dump the trash. So then he comes and dumps the trash, yeah. and this guy in with a hood and a mask jumps out when he and the guy turns around and he's running back, and the guy's like chasing him, and then he goes and he shuts the door, and the guy's there and he's knocking on the door, and then he leaves. It was like, and it because that's what everybody pictures in their head, like when they're running back. And it, yep. I watched that and I laughed so hard because it's like that's what everybody pictures in their head. So if you if if you can tap into a fear that people have. And they have it instinctually and they had it, you know, it's in their DNA and you can tap into that. I mean, it, it, and then the, the thing at the end, I, it, I totally didn't expect it or whatever. And it was such a powerful um, experience. Anyway, that's just the long way to talking about making your point. And have you ever heard of the book called The Eye of the Beholder? I think it's called Eye of the Beholder. It's a cinematography book. Uh, no. So... No, no, I, I don't know much about cinematography. Everything I know about cinematography, I was taught by Jeremy. So it's interesting because in the book, 
it gives scenarios on how to build tension visually. So there's a hallway and there's doors in the hallway and there's a, a, a girl walking down the hallway. And so the, one of the ways they do visually is like if you know there's a killer behind one of those doors and you can't see behind the doors, then that's one way of creating tension, that missing tension where there's something behind the doors, but you can't see it. Then it kind of goes into like a Hitchcock technique where what he would do is he would have the girl walking to one door to open it. But we would see behind the door and see there's a killer waiting on her. So as she's getting closer right. and closer and closer, you see the killer is waiting for her to open that door. Um, and it has right. different kind, like there's the mysterious suspension and there's the dread mis- suspension, right? Like you're dreading her open that door. Right. So much about good storytelling is suspense and mystery and you infuse all these things in it. And I find like a lot of the things, you, they dissipate it needlessly. They dissipate the mystery. They dissipate the, yeah. the stuff needlessly and they kind of take that away. I think horror greatly suffers when you take that away. If you watch Get Out and the mystery of like, who are these people? and What the fuck is going on? And, you know, and him figuring it out and learning about it, that starts, that's so compelling and so spooky and so interesting. You got to have all these elements or you, the first uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, when she's reading the diary and investigating these things about the kids or whatever, that's that, you know, none of the other movies come, maybe Dreamcatchers, but none of the other movies come as close to that movie because of the mystery about Freddy Krueger and all those things. All that to say is yeah. he creates tension and mystery really well in this movie. Assault on Precinct 13, I think, is one of his best movies. And, and it's funny because it's one of the earliest things he ever made. Um, so clearly, all of the things that became you know, hallmarks of John Carpenter's work were, were already in him at the very beginning of his career. Mm-hmm. You know? And he's got, you know, if you look at his IMDb, he's got like eight or ten short films that he made probably college projects, you know, I haven't seen any of them, but I, now I really want to see them all because I'm curious, like how much, how much of, of what he is, is in all of those short films. I'm betting it's a lot because it feels very instinctive for him. Like it doesn't feel like a thing that he had to learn how to do. I wish that, uh, I wish that we lived close so we could like get all those movies and, and like sit down and watch them all and talk about them at the same time. Yeah. But there's different kind, like there's intellectual directors that have learned craft and technique and they heavily plan out their shot list. They do vision boards and, and they show up and, and, it, and they have a strong idea of what you're going to do. And they've already thought out camera lenses and angles. But there's like, like with Mark, I, I did a movie called All I See Is you, With You uh, with Mark Forrester. Um, and also uh, Christopher Nolan work like this. Um, but what they would show up, uh, they didn't. Th- they didn't pre-plan anything with the scene. They know the story. They're rooted and strong within the story. So they show up and they say, "Let's see what you do." And they would see the actor's first instincts, and then they start building the scene and the the shooting of it around those instincts. And that's to me one of the f- a fun and exhilarating way to work. And I guarantee John Carpenter's like that. I bet he uses his instincts like he shows up and not really pre-planning, but just kind of shooting from the hip and figuring out. And, and I'm sure the actors love working with directors like that. And I'm sure the rest of the crew hates their guys. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. <laughs> because, because if you can't plan for anything as, as a member of the crew, oh my God, that is the most frustrating thing. I, I've been on set where a director was sort of winging it, where they were sort of shooting from the hip and the crew is ready to drag them out. Well, back and how skilled was that director? Yeah. I mean, because... Uh, the reality is, is, uh, you know, those, the things that I've done that on, they've had, they had time and money and that director was, each director was highly skilled. And, uh, so, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of time and money that makes up for a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah, I mean, I get like on the expanse, we couldn't do that shit. You know, like, you know, we would have to No, on on a TV shooting schedule. You can't do that. You can't just show up and go, hey, what if we try this? Yeah, and if you did, it'd be <laughs> shit. Because, you know, can't, so, camera angles and stuff don't work. They're, you know, I, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but if you go back and watch The Shining, the making of The Shining, you see how often Kubrick was switching camera angles, sw- uh, rewriting scenes in the moment, doing just, he, yeah. you know, I think there is, uh, there is a thing like with actors like can acting 
uh, or and I think it's similar with writing and directing, where actors will prepare a performance in their mind uh, alone in their preparation, and then they show up, and that's the performance they bring, no matter who they're working with, no matter the environment, no matter anything, right. they're stuck in that thing, which to me is dead. It's dead. It's like a, it's a memory that it, it that is not living in real time. And then, you yeah. know, but there's the same thing with uh, directors. They have an idea in their head. They have a way they're going to shoot it and they show up. And even if it's dead, they stay clean. They, they cling to that thing. But if, you know, if you allow, if you do the preparation and allow yourself to be in the moment as a writer, as a director, as an actor, just to feel what, what's happening. And there could be a scene where the presence of the other actor is different than what you were picturing. And then you have to use that within the scene to, to make it something real and honest happening in that moment. And I think that's what Carpenter does extremely well with all his films. That is the essence of guerrilla filmmaking. Though. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, the, early, the early John Carpenter movies, he had, he had no money. I mean, it, it, we're talking like $100,000 budgets, which even, even at the time was barely enough to put a crew mm -hmm. together. And so it's to successfully make something when you don't have the locations you need, you don't have the props you need, you don't have the time you need. I think that ability to improvise within the constraints of what you have, like obviously the kind of a camera equipment you have tells you some of the things you're going to be able to do on camera angles and that kind of stuff, right? I mean, some equipment just won't do the things that other equipment will. And so if you've got that, you just can't do those other things. So there's constraints there too, but... Once you have the pieces that you have, the ability to take those pieces and go within the limits of what I've got, I think I can get this shot. That's what guerrilla filmmaking is. And Carpenter instinctively was doing that right out of the gate. Like I'm, I, there are scenes in, in Assault on Precinct 13 that I know for a fact that guy did not have a permit to shoot on that street. <laughs> like I know John Carpenter wasn't getting permits and like walking off the street. He was just running out there with some cameras and going, drive by, drive by, drive by. <laughs> like shooting a shot and then getting out of there before the police were called. Yeah. Right. But in order to successfully do that, you have to be able to improvise in the moment. And I think, I think that is, that is the genius of that kind of filmmaker is they get there, they look at the street, they go, I've got 30 minutes before the police are called. Here's the shot I need to get. Put the camera there. Put the actor there. Let's go. And you just shoot yeah. it two or three times and then you run away before the cops show up. Yeah. yeah. You know, what's interesting is I, I think uh, I, had, um, I had a teacher that I work with and she would say, you know, you have to have a talent to getting access to your talent. And I think one of the things with somebody like a John Carpenter is like I, I have a writer friend of mine who, um, who wrote a very successful movie. And he was so highly praised that after that movie, he said, I couldn't write anything for nine months because everything I wrote, I was like, man, this is shit. It's not living up to what people are saying or thinking about me. And I realized that I got locked into the result and the praise and I forgot about the process that, you know, the process, you know, right. I'm, I'm comparing something to a finished, polished movie. I forget about those days where the, the grind where all, the characters didn't have distinct voices and I didn't understand the plot and just constantly working and working, working and finally getting that thing. Yeah. But I think, uh, but what he, you know, ultimately what, what he said was, is that, you know, conflict, like if I start working with studios or, you know, some people thrive on conflict, it wakes them up, it gets their, you know, um, but you know, I, I don't operate in that way. This is what my friend was saying is like, there's a lot of things that shut me down. And I, I suspect that John Carpenter, when he's in an environment where he has complete control, where he brings, he, he's constantly working with the same people, his, his, uh, his ex-wife and his friends and his people that he pulls in, uh, Kurt Russell, because he creates this environment that he knows he thrives in. And I think as soon as he gets pushed back from studio or as soon as he starts getting other people, uh, other um, people that want to have control over his thing, I think it shuts his talent off. I think it shuts him off. And yeah. that's, you know, that's just a theory I have because when he went back, you know, he went, he did the studio route for a little bit and he didn't like it. And then he went and did They Live and he did um, uh, another, I think he did The Fog. Was it The Fog? They Live in The Fog. But then he kind of started finding his... No, The Fog was very early for him. Oh, yeah, it was. The Fog was a very early There was two films that he did where he kind of went back into the, and I know They Live was one of them. We kind of went back in the... Prince of... Was it Prince of Darkness? It might have been, yeah. 
Okay, so he kind of went back into his indie roots and kind of started firing off these movies again. And then, and then he got a few more studio swings at the bat, and he kind of buried that. In. Oh no, I know, I know, I know the one that I know the one you're talking. About. The one that he did, uh, the studio film he did that. No, it was um, it was Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Yeah, yeah. That 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 movie. I think that movie broke him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it was it was a it was a big studio film. It was it was a big it was big stars. It was Chevy Chase and Daryl Hannah. Who were like mega stars at the time? He had he had a big budget to do you know all the visual effects with, but because it was a studio film, you know, like there was a lot of voices in the mix. And I, it's not a good movie. You you can tell he's like all you know that the, what you were talking about that authenticity of filmmaking that he he has that we that we fell in love with early on. It's none of it is there. It. Memoirs of Invisible Man feels very mechanical. It feels very by the numbers. It feels very inauthentic. Yeah, I, I think I, I think uh, Memoirs of an Invisible Man was was probably a low point for him. And and it was right around the same time he was gonna, he was getting ready to do uh, Escape from L.A., which was again uh, not a good movie. Death blow. Yeah, and and again very inauthentic, and and it felt like. It almost felt like a parody yeah. of Escape from New York. But here's the thing, though. You know, I don't want to jump ahead because this is a three-parter. All right, so yeah. this is our this yeah. is our first John Carpenter, and then we're gonna get to the second period uh, in the next podcast, which is my favorite, which I cannot wait. I don't know how we're gonna get through that because we got Halloween, we got Escape from New York, we got the Thing. I mean, we I don't know how we're gonna break yeah. that down in one episode but um let us know what you think if you enjoy us kind of going off and taking this deep dives or you like shut up dipshits and stick to the expanse <laughs> we're here for you man we're here to entertain um i would be remiss though before we finish this podcast to not um because after assault on precinct 13 he went and made a little money by doing some tv movies which he yeah. did his very first uh movie with his longtime collaborator Kurt Russell. One of the, yeah. one of our, one of the, a big fan, big fan of the pod. Uh, oh yeah. He's a big fan of our podcast. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. I would call uh, him a friend of the show. Yeah. I'd call him a friend of the yeah. show. Um, yeah. uh, personal friend of mine, family friend, big fan of the podcast, but, uh, he did Elvis in an Elvis movie yeah. and it's fucking, my dad would, my dad was obsessed with Elvis Presley. I think he thought he was Elvis Presley, but I told in like another life, but I was like, dad, you were alive when he was alive. You can't. <laughs> couldn't have been Elvis Presley but he's still he's like he's stubborn so he still believed it but um so we watched all of the Elvis movies all the time and the Kurt Russell one was my favorite Kurt Russell did such he actually got an Emmy nomination for that and it was that yeah. you know John Carpenter caught him at the right time because he just did uh Kurt Russell just did a decade of Disney movies and Kurt Russell's like, yeah. I'm going to be a baseball player. I'm making money. I'm going to put my head down and do these Disney movies. And then when baseball didn't work out the way he thought it was going to with an injury, uh, then he said that he wanted to come back to acting. But he had, uh, and, and, you know, this is always interesting to me because we know and love Kurt Russell. He's always been a star my whole life. And it's hard for me to think that there was a time when Kurt Russell couldn't get a job or couldn't get. Yeah. things made because he was a Disney actor and now he's a little bit long in the tooth to do those Disney movies and everybody is like you know you think about some of these Disney actors now you know you, you, they wouldn't be as interesting to you if they come up to do these things and so he had to claw his way up and John Carpenter was a guy that gave him a shot to do this thing and it just so happened that Kurt Russell did a movie with Elvis Presley and had this personal knowledge of him where Kurt Russell kicks him in the shin and you know and he you know, had a real, it was, he, uh, Elvis made a, a really big mark on him. And, uh, so he did this Elvis movie and I thought Kurt Russell was he's terrific and he really showed the range of his talent. And then Kurt Russell then did that movie where he played the, the sniper on the roof of the college. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. So he was really working to, and, um, you know, Carpenter talks about, you know, and, and we'll, we'll just touch on this cause this is more about the next thing, but he had to fight to get Kurt Russell in his movies. He, he had to fight to get him in uh, Escape from New York. Like that was, uh, the, you know, that in, or, or the thing. Like he was not a name at that point. Right. 
you know, and then you can't, and it's just, it's hard to go back and think about, wait, you had to fight for Kurt Russell to get in there? But it's crazy because he had to, and so I realize now how much Kurt Russell own, owes John Carpenter to the career that he has. You got to have, yeah. you know, somebody to believe in you like that. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that, that's a nice uh, lead up to talking about the, the next phase of Carpenter uh, on the next one of these, where it's, it's peak Carpenter. It's the monster, the, the guy who like can do no wrong for like a dozen movies in a row. Uh, I'm excited to talk about that period because some of my favorite movies come out of that period of Carpenter's career. Thank you guys for hanging out. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.